Right. So thanks for sticking around till the last talk of the last session of the last day of the workshop. Uh, okay, so I'll talk. Ab this is a, I'll talk about computer information complexity and its uh, joint work with my student John Schneider. So the the basic setup is one that you've seen many times. So. Just to be specific, we have Alice and Bob, they have shared randomness, and they're doing something with the protocol. In this case, they're computing, it's actually, it matters that they're trying to compute some function f of x, y, which means that both of them in the end have the value of f of x, y. Uh, okay, so this is the setup. The zero error information complexity is what they reveal to each other while they speak, so it's a function of two things. It's a f uh, they, Sorry, let, let's take it a bit more slowly. The, the information cost of a protocol is what the protocol reveals to the players, and it's a function of both the protocol and the prior distribution. And the zero error information complexity of a function is the infimum over all protocols of this quantity. of what. So it's the least amount of information that you need to reveal in order to solve the problem with zero error. And it's, it's a bit un important that even if mu doesn't have full support, to correctly compute means to correctly compute on all inputs. That's a minor technical point. But So basically, I want to look at all the protocols that always do the right thing. They're allowed to use randomness, particularly private randomness, and that's important. And I want to reveal as little information as possible. And this quantity is operational in that if you take the amortized communication complexity with vanishing error, uh, then it's actually equal in the limit to this quantity. And uh, one way to think about the discussion today is actually understanding how efficiently this is. How, what's the rate of convergence? OK, so here is the, computa the computation problem. We are given a truth table of f, let's say f is Boolean, that's not very important, and a, a distribution mu. So luckily, the information complexity is actually continuous in mu. So you don't need to terribly worry about that. Let's assume it's just given you in binary with some, the, those are dyadic numbers. And the goal is given a, a number delta produce a delta approximation of the information complexity of f with that distribution. Uh, okay, so with communication complexity, it's, an, uh, it's a worst case notion, but even if it was average case, it would be pretty easy to brute force the problem. All I have to do, so okay, so no function has more communication complexity than log the size of the input, or not much more. So just brute force all the protocol trees of depth that, or maybe a little bit over that. It's not fun, it's not pleasant, but at least it's doable. It's a search over a finite set of things. So at least that's why 2015 you don't see many computability questions because most of the things that are computable are easy. Uh, so it can be brute force. IC cannot be brute force, unfortunately. And the reason is that you have this infimum here, and it's there for a reason. Actually, uh, I conjecture that for most problems, you cannot realize this quantity with any finite protocol. So basically, it's, you get a sequence of protocols, they approach the limit as they grow longer and longer, and no specific longer protocols actually can give you a lower IC. And this is already true for the 2B10 function, which is the simplest kind of function that actually computes as opposed to moving data around. Already there, you, you get that the information if you restrict yourself to R round or R bit protocols, the information compl uh, complexity of N, you, so you get the term that you would get in the limit, plus an, uh, uh, a second order term that's like one over R squared. So that means that you need many rounds if you want to approach the limit. Mark? Yeah? In the case of zero error expected communication, you still have the issue that the protocols can be longer and longer. R right. It, it's not completely trivial. It's almost trivial. So what you do, you pick some delta, you run for log n over delta. If that didn't succeed, you become frustrated and just exchange the inputs. 
and that modification doesn't cost you much or it's it's yeah it's not completely obvious but it's it's a simple Exactly. Right. So uh, here we are also trying to compute up to delta. Uh, I mean, all it's a ra it's potentially an irrational number. So even for this, this is an ir we have a f kind of a formula for it, an equation that it's all, but it's an irrational number. So all you can do is compute approximations. Um, okay. So it turns out that if you restrict yourself to R round protocols, and that's something that's been discussed by. Uh, alone in the morning, uh, it, it becomes a much easier problem. So you can compute it. Um, so Maya and Ishwar do it using one technique. Another approach is actually if you use this result, it also is true for R rounds. And there we have a, you can have more explicit bounds on the rate of convergence. So basically, this result would tell you that to compute this, it would, give you, it would tell you what n to take such that if you compute this quantity with f to the n, then this is within delta of each other. And then you could just, communication complexity you can brute force, so that's, that's one way to get an algorithm. This is nice because if you hate, because this approach would require you to, to do some analysis with continuous functions, it's doable, but it's more work than just enumerating communication protocols if you're just trying to get a, a computability result. Uh, okay, so this, okay, so unfortunately, so what is the problem? The problem is that unfortunately, it's not clear how to generalize this without an R, without the R. So what we get is, is a, a non-increasing sequence of numbers that converges to the answer, but we don't know the rate of convergence, so we don't know how many terms to take. And you can imagine this is a, uh, there are many ways to get such a sequence. Another way is just to enumerate all the protocols. There are countably many of them. Just go over all of them and every time list the best one you have so far. But again, it's not clear where to stop. So say R is 10 to the 10 to the 10 and you're stuck at some number. Maybe after some more steps it will actually drop. And there are examples like this. So pretty much any non-computability problem where the answer is that it's not computable is because something like this happens, that the word problem doesn't, you can't match it for, the, for 10 to the 10 to the 10, but then suddenly it does match. Uh, okay, so the main theor theorem is essentially, it's, a, it's about understanding protocols more so than about uh, computation. So basically the main theorem is, is an effective rate of convergence that says that if you have a function from A times B, uh, then if you want to be within epsilon, it's enough to look at protocols that have W uh, rounds, where W is something like N over epsilon to the N. I don't think that the bound is tight, but this is a, a bound. And that's enough by what I previously said, it's enough to actually comp give an algorithm that computes the information complexity, even with some running time guarantee, but not a very impressive one. Um, Okay, so that's, uh, that's the main result, and the color, as a corollary, we get uh, a, an algorithm that works by, as I said, just take enough copies, and, uh, which, where enough depends on this W, enumerate all the protocols for F with that many copies, look at the amortized communication, and that will be within epsilon of the answer. Okay, so that's, uh, so the, but the main, the main theorem is, is, is really this. And, uh, okay, one thing that I should point out, so if you haven't seen this problem before, it's a, it's, it's a very annoying problem in that it's actually, it's hard to believe that it's hard in some sense. Uh, it's very easy to almost solve it, uh, but somehow it's actually, yeah, it took, took a while and uh, somehow it's, it's elusive in that it looks like you almost solved it, but then you realize that the details don't work out and the details actually matter. Mark, yeah? There was some intuition about what kind of problem is it? Is it convex, non-convex, of what type? So you can write a continuous set of convex inequalities. So it's like uh, if you know the Dirichlet problem, for example, that's a convex equality, so to compute a harmonic function given boundary conditions. 
So geometrically it's similar, but the problem is that you don't uh, are not allowed inequalities in all directions because you're only allowed inequalities that are generated by valid messages. And so it's, it's, uh, that's what, it's kind of a combination of a discrete and a continuous component. If it was just continuous, you could probably use some approximation theory, but it's, it's almost like things you get from like Markov decision processes and on continuous spaces and, but control theory literature, we looked at actually it was no help either, maybe. So very, so eventually we had to drill down and understand protocols. So that's what I'll talk about in the next 15 minutes. So what the proof, okay, so what is the proof about? The proof is about converting a protocol pi into an equivalent protocol that has only W run. So you start from the definition of IC. For any epsilon, there is a, pro a finite protocol that is within epsilon of the information complexity. And the problem is to convert it into a protocol that has some structure, finite structure which we can enum enumerate. So this is the problem. You're given a protocol, convert it into a protocol with not too many rounds that has the does the same thing and has the same cost. Or almost the same cost, obviously you cannot get the same cost. And this is done in a number of steps where at each step you add a little bit more structure and eventually you have this structure that there are W rounds. Okay, so the first step is to understand what is a protocol, what, what are general protocols made of. And in information complexity, it's actually private randomness is better than public randomness. You can always uh, simulate public randomness with private randomness, but not vice versa, because if you want public coins, let Alice take her private coins and publish them. This is crazy from communication perspective, but from information perspective, it costs zero. Okay, so we can deal with private coin protocols. So, and what, what is a private coin protocol? For each history H, if it's Alice's say turn to speak, there is, a C, there is a function that tells Alice, given your input, this is the probability with which your next bit is one. So it's a function from A to zero one, a is the set of Alice's inputs, that on, on uh, input x, Alice will produce a Bernoulli random variable with probability sigma h of x. That's, that's what the, a protocol is. I, I didn't do anything yet. Uh, so, uh, and the proof proceeds in three steps. The first step is, is to reduce the number of types of signals that we use. So maybe you could use the same signal many, many times, but the, diff the number of different functions that you use should be bounded in terms of n and epsilon. And the second step is to convert that into a protocol that actually uses a bounded number of rounds. And from there is what I said before, this can be used to approximate, that becomes a bounded round AC, which can be approximated efficiently. Okay, so the first step with almost without loss, with a little work, we can make all the signals very weak. How? Because you can always take a signal and break it into many much weaker signals that do the same thing. So as a first step, we can make all the signals very weak and roughly of the same power, where you define the power in a proper way. Uh, so all the signals, uh, are very weak and have roughly the same power, but they could be a lot of different kinds. It's like a sphere, a multidimensional sphere of possible signals. And as a first step, we reduce the number of distinct signals by using, uh, by getting some ethernet on the set of possible signals. So we replace each signal by a convex combination of its neighbors on the net. And, uh, so well, how do we do it? Well, you just represent it like this, and then you use public randomness, or which we assume we can get it from private randomness. You sample Z according to this distribution alpha, and then Alice sends the signal according to one of these conventional sigmas. So notice that this is done publicly, so the only actual step is this one. So now the only signals used are signals from the pre-approved list from this, from this Ethernet. 
Uh, unfortunately, okay, so this is a perfect simulation because you can see that this signal is actually distributed uh, exactly like the original signal. The only problem is that it reveals additional information. Well, the information revealed is what Z and Sigma Z reveal together. It's actually convenient to first look at what Sigma Z reveals and then what Z reveals. What Sigma Z reveals is exactly what Sigma was revealing before because it's the same. It's distributed exactly the same. How, how many bits does each signal correspond to? One. One. It's a Boolean function. It's a function from the input space to, to the interval 0, 1. So this net is on a dimension space of what dimension? Of A, the size of A. So to represent each point, you need this many neighbors. Is, is the size of Alice's input. Okay, so the main point is that you can bound it. It's not hard to bound it, but the important point is that you bound it relatively to the, in terms relative to the value of sigma. So it's sigma, it's whatever sigma reveals times some little o of epsilon term. And this is important because sigma can be very, 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 very weak signal. We don't have any control so far on how small sigma is. And so you have, you have to do it in relative terms. So that's the first step. Uh, so why are we not done? Because there are this many, so the, the net is of some size that only depends on epsilon and n, but the signals can be very weak and you could have many, many copies of the same signal. So this tree, we are guaranteed that there is only Q different species, so each cartoon represents one type of signal. So there are uh, Q different species on this tree, but each species can appear many times. And so far, we don't have any control on how many times each kind of, so it could be very, very weak signals that appear very many times, and we have no control over that. So, so what was the role of the delta? Why did you have to be close to half? Because uh, otherwise these inequality, these inequalities rely on some effective compactness. When you're close to zero or one, you're in trouble. Actually, I only need to stay away from zero and one, I think. At that point, no. But also I want all of them to be of this roughly the same power because otherwise, so I can get an epsilon net on the sphere, but I cannot get a finite epsilon net on the ball because there are many scales going in depth, so I need them to be roughly of the same power. That's, that's another reason. Uh, okay, so, but if you lost me, let's uh, reconvene. Uh, so now we, are we have Q different signals, and we need to convert it into a protocol that uses few rounds. So what's, how can you do it? How, how you, can you, so you have this Q different uh, species, how can you control the number of rounds? Well, you bundle signals of the same type. So when Alice needs to send sigma to Bob, she will instead take T copies of sigma. So generate IAD T copies of sigma, sigma, put them in a box and send it to Bob. Okay, and next time Bob needs one of these type of signals, instead of asking, expecting Alice to get it, he will just take one out of, a box, of the box and use that to continue the the protocol, and they'll do it until for the next t minus one rounds until he runs out, then he needs to order more. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. And how many do you put in this box? Well, that's how you, that's the main issue in this step, which is, I think, the main step, actually. So, you need, uh, so this bundling, by the way, again, achieves perfect simulation. So what, uh, what I just said doesn't hurt the performance of the protocol. The only thing that it hurts is that if by the end of the protocol you have some unused signals, that's information wasted. You received something, you paid for it, and you didn't use it. So uh, if you select T to be too large, in the end you get stuck with too much signals which you have to pay for because you learn from them. If you make T too small, then you'll need to reorder many times so you'll get too many rounds. So essentially you need to get T large enough and we select T to be roughly epsilon over Q such that, the, right, because in the, uh, so the, okay, so we select such that the total value 
of the size of this, this box is roughly epsilon over q. Let's see the intuition. In the end, you get stuck with q boxes, right? With q different types of signals. I want the amount of waste of each type to be something like this. And then I'm in good shape because I'm stuck with a total of epsilon and use the inventory. OK. So how do we decide about, uh, on t? Well, we look at how much information that do t sig are t signals worth. So if already one signal is bigger than the size of a box, so like this, then we just make t equals to 1 and we get one signal. And uh, in that case, we waste nothing, actually. Now, otherwise, we look for the smallest s such that s signals together reveal between epsilon over 2q and epsilon over q uh, information. So this is kind of the typical case, right? So we fill up the box between half full and full and send it. And the third case, it's actually you c signals, the, their effect is submodular. So the more signals you get, the less value you get out of them. So it's possible, it's actually to be expected that eventually even an infinite number of signals will not be able to fill one box because information doesn't grow forever. And in that case, you just send some maximum length. So it doesn't matter really what you do. OK, so th those are the three cases. Uh, so, why, uh, so first of all, we need to see why they're exhaustive, but I pretty much said it already. So before even I explain that, notice that these quantities are compute, can be computed by both Alice and Bob. They don't need to know. They don't depend on their inputs. Their quantities about random variables. So this is a well-defined protocol. And to see that those cases are exhaustive, you need some submodularity property that the more signals I send, the less marginal utility I get from the next one. So either the first signal is enough, or the first signal puts me in this case, or the first signal is worth less than epsilon over 2q, in which case, when I keep adding signals, the step size will be less than epsilon over 2q. So either I'll eventually hit this interval, or I'll get stuck forever below Three. This is the uh, This is like the history. Uh, this is the history, essentially. Uh, so this is think about it as the history of the cur of uh, of the original protocol, even. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the uh, so the information waste, as I explained, is at most one box per signal. And the number of rounds, well, there it comes back to this question about uh, average. So the, it, you would expect that, so the, the most the protocol can reveal is log n bits of information. So if the size of every, and the size of every box is at least epsilon over 2, 2q, except for the q boxes at the end. So it's at most q plus uh, 2q log n over epsilon. And that would be correct, except it's a, an average case quantity and not a worst case quantity. So we are forced to use Markov once more. To, so this is how much you would expect it to last. This is how many boxes you would expect to send at worst case, even if you're revealing log n information. And then get another factor, because we have to use Markov to say that this happens with probability 1 minus epsilon. So we, we go for this many rounds, and we we then we fail with a very small probability, in which case we can exchange the inputs. So if we, fa if we fail after this many rounds, we just spend one more round, exchange the inputs, and this happens with such a low probability that we can afford it. Uh, so what we get is this, that W rounds is su suffice for uh, an explicit W, and you compute you this as I discussed to complete the construction. I'll spare you that part. Uh, okay, so just to summarize, this is the main result that this can be done in some exponential time, uh, double or triple exponential time. But I, uh, I'm not sure it, it should be somewhat improvable. But notice that even communication complexity is not so easy to compute. So maybe you can shave one or two exponents out of it. But it's never going to be super efficient because you are just computing the communication complexity from truth tables. So 
uh, and basically it, the, the proof went in several steps, converting at each step simplifying pi, somewhat reducing the number of different signals, then bundling signals together to reduce the number of rounds, and then computing uh, the information complex, best information complexity with this number of rounds. Uh, so some open problems. So first of all, to generalize this, so this is for a zero error, uh, and generalizing it for epsilon error, uh, I think that it just would require more technical work. I don't. I think this should be doable. I have no doubts that it's computable, but uh, it requires some more work. The most important problem, in my opinion, sorry, is is understanding this rate of convergence, this dependence on the number of rounds. So from this paper, we get this upper bound that it's. There, to get within epsilon, you need R that is at most n over epsilon to the n. In the opposite direction, we have uh, that for 2 bit n, R of epsilon is at least 1 over root epsilon. So notice that here n is 4. So at least it means that when n is constant, it should be polynomial in epsilon, and this bound is fine, actually. It's, it's tied up to which polynomial. So the interesting question is, is can, it actually be exp can it be actually something like epsilon to the n, or does it have to be some function of n, maybe 2 to the n, and then polynomial in epsilon, for example? That's, if I had to guess, I would say that the rate of convergence is some function of n, which can be pretty terrible. We know that you need interaction, after all, to solve like even uh, Nissan Victors and so on. So you, we know that you cannot get away with very few rounds if you have some complicated function. But this trouble is a function of n because it also applies to communication. And then the tail, when you have more and more rounds and manage to reduce information, I believe should behave something like this, or some polynomial in epsilon, but that's, that's open. Whether epsilon to the n is necessary, or it's f of n times poly epsilon. Uh, and then looking at other quantities, so I think the most closely related is the amount of entanglement needed in two prover quantum games, but uh, basically to see if, if anything from what we learned can, can be helpful there. Okay, so uh, this concludes the technical part of the talk. So uh, I wanted to tell you about a program in Paris, uh, to announce a program in Paris next year, so but maybe I should take questions first. No, no, go ahead. Okay. All right, so uh, some of you are actually par participating in organizing it, but so uh, we are organizing a program at the Institute Henri Poincaré in Paris uh, called Nexus of Information and Computation Theories. So this is basically the main message is this website. Uh, and so it's organized by organized with Bobak Nazar, with Anoop, and with Aslan uh, from uh, Paris. And uh, so we have, it's a 10-week program. In addition to a boot camp and a flagship uh, workshop, there are four themes, two, uh, two week long each. Uh, so those are the titles. And uh, Essentially, all the information about uh, is is on this website, and so hope to see many of uh, you there as well, and talk to us uh, or look it up there. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks.